Hallelujah. When I, as usual, have been preparing the sermon for a while, and then a day or two ago, I sat down with it again, and I just felt restless and anxious, and in the perplexity of spirit, I found myself troubled, and finally I realized I hadn't even asked the pivotal question. I said, Lord. What would you have your people hear? What is your message for us? And instantly, instantly, the voice said, the Gentiles are coming. And I was reminded of a dream I had a couple of years ago, which I shared with our father, and I saw revival or a service, I, I can't tell, but the place where we held it looked like an NFL stadium, but it was covered, or it looked like the New Jersey Arts Performing Center, where it holds 20, 30, 40,000 people, and every seat was occupied, every seat, and you couldn't tell Celestial Church had anything to do with it, because what was interesting to me is I looked at every row and there were hundreds of people and you saw suits and blouses and hats. But for every hundred I saw, there were two in Satan. For every hundred, another two, a row that had one, a row that had two, at most maybe three, but majority were all dressed in mock. And then I looked, and at the bottom there, at the stage, far, far, far away, was the shepherd. He was wearing his coat. It was all white, and he had his loin. He was covered in sweat, and he was wiping each person with his loin. And then he looked up and said, what are you waiting for? Start from the back. And then I noticed that the elders were at the top, and each person was doing the same in each row. And then I woke up. And then there was a second dream, but I'll get to that in a minute. But the Lord said the Gentiles were coming. But when you think about that, and you think about this church that has been around for what, 73 years? It has been around for the full lifespan of a man. The Bible says he gives us 70 years at best. Anything over that is just cheddar. 73 years, a full-grown man's life, but yet we're still crawling like children. The church is still crawling like an infant. Our parishes are makeshift parishes. You have churches where they're holding 20, 30 people, and within six months, even those 30 people splinter into two or three more parishes and go set up their own competing parishes with now 10 in each one of them. Our children and the youth are leaving en masse from the church. And even many, I speak to some people, what church are you going to? I'm not going anywhere. Why? Ah, no, 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 no. They would rather stay home than attend church. And I know we all say, oh, well, you know, there's a lot that is going on and Satan is waging war. Satan will never not wage war. But at what point do we start to look at ourselves and ask what part are we playing in helping Satan do his work? So many things, the culture that has been imported into the church, the patterns that we have repeated so often that we have mistaken patterns now for ordinances that stand in the way with the true spirit of the church. And so the church continues to lose its identity and the church at large is losing its identity. But we keep still saying, this is the church that will cleanse the whole world. When you think about the spiritual maturity of the church, or the spiritual immaturity of the church, I should say, when you think about the things that still cause schisms in this church, 
the factions, the divisions, the things we run after. How we're worried about who is sitting in whose position, who is kneeling or who is standing or who is doing first or second prayer. And all this nonsense that has nothing to do with the business of the Lord. You have to ask yourself, how is this church going to cleanse the world? And I know, you all know it, chapter and verse, Habakkuk 2, 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. In the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. It shall not tarry. But when do we start to ask ourselves, what part are we playing in it? At what point do we start to look at ourselves and say these ideas that we have created of a God who is this miracle working magician God and Paul that we can just go to for blessings and favors whenever we need it with works and pineapples and coconuts and whatever else we need to do instead of a God that desires a relationship with us. When are we going to start to admit that maybe these are the things that are keeping this grown man from taking its position in the world? And we'll say, well, VOG, what role are we playing in all of this? And many of us will say, well, at least in VOG we're not bad. But I'll counter that, that the not bad is the enemy of the good. And some of you will say, well, at least in VOG we're good and we're trying. Then I will tell you that the good is the enemy of the better. And some will say, well, we're at least better than most parishes. The better is the enemy of the best. And here is the thing we have to read up. Saints and wages war and there's witches and wizards and all of that. Yes, they've always existed. Long before you and I were here, they will be here long after we are gone. But you know how Satan deals with a church that is not so bad? A church that is good? He doesn't deal with disaster. He doesn't bring great trouble. You know how he sets us up? He makes us comfortable. He puts us at ease. And the very thing we claim is our strength is the very thing he uses to destroy us. We have a shepherd who is before the altar day and night, fasted and praying. So why do we need to fan the flame of our faith? We have a shepherd who knows the chapter and verse and Bible and can give you spiritual elucidations of the word of God. So why do I need to do my own Bible study? When I arrive to Bible class, they will speak, they will teach. When I get to church, they will give me what I need to do, and I'm going to put my book away. The very thing that is our strength is what the enemy is using to kill us. And we don't know that. There is a terrible treaty. And when you think about churches that have become comfortable, the symptoms are very easy. If we have a town hall now, I guarantee you, I can tell you at least five things that will be mentioned. Our services are too long. We have to cut them short. Prayers are too long. We have to cut them short. Maybe we should start ringing bells to interrupt prayers. Think about this. Women's evangelism, we should start thinking about doing it once a month because you know what? People really aren't getting, when you do it once a month, then it will really become meaningful. And any time there is anything, we have prayer, somebody's having a special party, we have to go to a harvest. Do you know how much that hurts me? Let's cut everything short. Let's cut the word of the Lord short. Let's cut the services short. Let's skip women's evangelism because there is something more important out there. Why? Because we are comfortable. That is the symptom of a church Satan has made comfortable because we have nothing to really urge about. Not once have I heard in any of those discussions, any of those town halls where somebody says, Shepherd, how can we get deeper in our relationship with Christ? Nobody's interested in that. Because we're taking too long. That extra 10 minutes is going to ruin my life. I've got far more important things to do. And I love, love, love 
Hosea 13.13. Hosea 13.13 reads, The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. Listen to this. But he's an unwise son. Why? For he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth. Of he children. should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children, but yet he remains there. Thank you. Now, what is he saying? I want you to imagine that. The Lord is saying for many of us, imagine this child who is already in the fetus, who is in the uterus. He's been there for nine months, and the Lord is saying now. The travail, the time has come for you to push forth. The cervix is ripened. The cervix are softened. The cervix is opened. The time has come for you to push forth. But the child will not go. Why? Because it is comfortable in the uterus. It has been enjoying that maternal provision. It sleeps, it eats, it rejoices in that cocoon in the womb. Why do I want to go outside? with all the uncertainties, with all the dangers, with all the troubles, with all the sorrows that are out there. And the Lord says he's an unwise child. Perhaps this is the malaise and the malady that is even dealing with a church like this voice of grace. The Lord has said to us, break forth already, but we still remain in the uterus of God's provisions when his divine providence is standing and saying come out already and grow up and let me make of you the man who will rule the estate you have a part to play in the story of this church that will cleanse the whole world but you can't do it when you remain in the fetal position and here is the thing you know I was speaking to my sister the other day and we had a conversation and there's something I just want to share with everybody you see, there are those gardeners of your comfort zone. They have good intention. And their intention is to continue to water the garden of your comfort zone. There are those people who have good intentions, but unwittingly, without knowing, they're in fact doing the business of the enemy and keeping you from the glory of your rising. Think about it. In Matthew 16, 20, he says, Then charged he his disciples that he should tell no man that it was Jesus Christ. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and he raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And what is he saying? Peter was there to keep Jesus in his comfort zone. Peter didn't even know what he was saying. Jesus had been in the uterus of God's provision for so long as master, as rabbi, as rabboni, as healer, as teacher. He had been praised and here he was about to go into Jerusalem where with palm fronts and hosanna they were going to head him their king. But he was not an unwise child. As Luke 2.52 tells us, he grew in wisdom and knowledge and in the stature of our Lord. So this Christ was not going to allow Peter to keep him in his comfort place. Instead, he looked past all of that into the Jerusalem, into the hurt, into the pain, into the thirst and the tears that were waiting for him, into the blood and the sweat was going to be. He looked into Golgotha where he knew his glory was waiting. I'm not talking about the people who stand in your way and try to hinder your glory like Joseph's brothers. No, 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 no. I'm talking about people like Naomi who said to Ruth and who said to, 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 to Opa, I have no more sons for you. My sons are dead. You're my daughter-in-laws. Now go back to your mother's home. Go back where? Into the uterus. Go back and be comfortable. Leave. Go find something else for yourself. There's nothing I have for you. And she kissed both of them. Ruth chapter 1 tells us. And beloved, sometimes even in Ruth's kisses, there is a Judas kiss. Just like in Peter's embrace, there is also a Judas kiss. And Opa said okay, and she kissed the mother-in-law, and she left, and she returned back into the uterus. She returned back 
into a comfort zone. And beloved, you never hear one more word about Oprah again for the rest of the length of the Bible. She dies in obscurity. Well, Ruth looked at her and set her face like flint and said, woman, do not entreat me not one more time to depart from you or to keep from falling after you. For wherever thou goest shall I go, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. And wherever thou lodgest, I will lodge. And where thou die, shall I die and be buried. And be it so unto me, and ever so severely, if anything but death separates you from me. And the Bible says, when she saw that she was steadfast minded to go with her, when she left speaking on her, when she saw that she was steadfast minded, when Satan realized Ruth was steadfast minded, Ruth was choosing uncertainty over the certainty of the universe. Ruth was choosing the pain, was choosing the hardship, the famine, was choosing everything else. Satan left Ruth alone and said, all right, I guess this glory is hers. And what was the glory Ruth was rising for? She knew she was to be in the lineage of this Christ. She was to be the great grandmother of this Jesus, however many times removed. And here was Naomi who had good intentions but was doing what? Was talking her out of that glory. And this is the same way Jesus knew Peter had good intentions. But Christ cannot be deceived. He looked right past Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. For thou savourest not the things of God but the things of men. To Jerusalem I go. To be crucified, to be humiliated, to be mocked, to be stripped, and to subjected to public humiliation and derision. And I must undergo all these things because I know the way to heaven goes right through Hades. There are many people like that in your life. They will tell you, don't. It's dangerous. It's not sensible. But nobody sees the vision God has for you except him. And what he has laid in your heart, nobody else can see. And sometimes, like David did, when David was asking, what shall the king do for who slays this man? His brother said, here you come again. You should be out there with the sheep. You should be the shepherd. What are you doing here? Go back home, you this little boy. But David knew the Lord had something better for him. Saul put his armor, put his shield, put everything on him. And David said, this is not me. All these good intentions, people, will continue to water your comfort zone. The problem with the comfort zone is it's convenient, but nothing will ever grow there. And we are surrounded, this voice of grace, with so many comforts. Oh my God, is this the voice of grace everyone has been talking about? Oh, you guys are so much better than all these parishes. And we believe it, and it continues to make us more comfortable. It's death by anesthesia. We're going to sleep, but it's the sleep of death. And it forces us not to ask the real questions. It forces us to take our focus off the real prize and to start to focus on other things because we think we're not that bad or we think we're good enough. And that is the enemy of the best. So what does God do? He sends labor pants to make the mother uncomfortable. To make her so uncomfortable, she will do anything. She will kick, she will scream, she will bite anything to push this child out. And the child who has been enjoying that uterus as well, the Lord will send us labor pains which feels like a little earthquake. He destroys that comfort zone. There is blood, there is trouble, there is tremors everywhere. And the comfort the child now has feels like danger and suddenly he wants to stretch forth and go into the mouth of the womb, into the upper air. You can choose to come out with the vitality of Christ in you, to face the dangers and the uncertainty. Or you can choose to remain in there. And what you do not realize is, by remaining in that comfort zone, the very womb and uterus that was once life to you and now become the graveyard in which you are buried. You can come out kicking and screaming with the vitality of life. 
Yes, there is uncertainty. Yes, there is pain. There is famine. There is danger. There is disappointment. There is heartache. There is all sorts of sorrows in this world. But that is your cross to carry. Or you can remain in there. Dying and dead. And come out stillborn. Like those cold, timid souls. Who never know the triumph of victory. Or the courage of defeat. Where and what part is VOG playing? We can't get so obsessed about the cathedral, beloved, that we forget and abandon the temple. Ye are the temple of the Lord. The Lord does not live in buildings by hand. What does he say in Acts 17, 24? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life unto all and breath on all things. But what does he desire? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might find him and feel after him, though he's not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of the poets have said. That's Acts 17. Now, in the ministry, there are so many ministries in this church. The last time we had the parochial meeting, I had to keep deleting and resending the text because every time I was getting the text after I sent it out, oh, damn it, you forgot my ministry. Oh, damn it, you forgot this committee. There are so many. And like 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, there are so many gifts, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counseling, preaching, apostolic gifts, prophetic gifts, evangelical gifts, administration. It says, but all of these things are serving one purpose, again, to work for the body. It says, is everybody an apostle? Is everybody an evangelist? Is everybody a prophet? I've given each person their gift according to my will for the glory of my name. But everybody desires. And this is the only church where once you get a certain promotion, you believe you have a right to preach. Do you understand the severity of standing on this podium? Do you understand the severity of being the voice of God unto men? Do you understand that we shall be judged more severely than any other? When you stand here, and you take the serious business and the majesty of the Lord and you make mockery and jest of it. When you stand here and you take this podium, the word of God with which he created the heavens and the earth, that before which angels tremble, and you make comedy with it. You come here with personal ideas. You come here with your own intelligence. You come here because I am this, I'm that, or because I have this rank or this robe, I have a right. Really? Where is the right that concerns the gift of God? The people who truly understand what it means absolutely run and reject it. How many times did God call him Moses? How many excuses did Moses give him? Jeremiah said, I do not want to speak your word, but it is like fire shut up in my bones. I cannot contain it. Even Paul would rather not, but he said, Woe unto me if I do not preach. This is what it means. The ministries are all different. What are you doing with your ministry? What am I doing with my ministry? The cathedral is not a building. It is you and I. The Gentiles are coming, but when they come, what will they find? At Ephesians 3 that was read to us, Paul simply declares that his ministry is simply about discharging and preaching Christ unto the Gentiles. That's the ministry that was given to him, preaching the riches that are available in this Christ, the mystery of the fellowship with this Christ. And that's why Paul said everywhere, I desire to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. What are you doing with yours? As prophets, you will come to church and you ask yourself, 
the measure of your service with God is how many people do I prophesy for today? Are you kidding? Do you really know what spirit is in you? Oh, this person has always prophesied. I can't wait to prophesy. Do you know what spirit is in you? If I don't prophesy for 10 years, so be it. If the Lord needs to speak, he will speak. The second dream I had was earlier this year. And in that dream, I don't know if it was this church. I don't know if it was a cathedral. It looked like it was in fact this church. But anyway, the service was done. And an evangelist was walking out of the service holding a Bible in his hand. And when he walked outside, there was a canopy out there, and there was probably 300, maybe 400 people, again, dressed in suits, dresses, hats, and they were waiting, and they looked famished, they looked forlorn, they looked bitten like they had traveled far and wide to be here, and they looked like they had been waiting for so long. And I said, Lord, what does it mean? He said, the Gentiles are already waiting, but you people aren't ready. They are starving, and you people aren't ready. He says, what are we going to feed them? The Lord said to Peter in John 21, he said, if you truly love me, feed my sheep. Simon, son of Jonas, does that love me? Lord, you know I love you, then feed my lamb. And what are we going to feed them with? And he gives us the answer right there in John 6, 55, for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is what my blood is drink indeed christ christ this is what we feed them and when you go to the book of jeremiah you know i laugh because so many times when you read in the old testament it's always the same thing the lord says cursed is anyone who doesn't obey the laws of this covenant therefore everyone was cursed because whoever is guilty of breaking one was guilty of breaking them all. And the Lord said, what else am I going to do for you people? You're so recalcitrant in spirit. You turn again to the same sins of your fathers. You saw the works. You saw the miracles. You saw everything I did. And yet you return to your idolatry. And here's an interesting thing. You see, when we put the laws before men, I've had this discussion with my brother so many times and, you know, at some point, I just said to each his own. I don't preach law. And I'll tell you why. Because as God was writing his laws on the tablet of stone, guess what was happening? Even before he finished, thou shalt not have any other God before me. The Israelites were doing what? Were creating a golden calf that were going to worship. The very stones on which the laws were written to give them life were the stones that Moses smashed on them to destroy them. There is something about laws that just pricks the serpent in man. It makes us completely combative to the spirit of God. It doesn't bring life. It makes us even more children of the devil. There is only one place where the law is fulfilled and where life is given. And that's in Christ. In Romans 7, listen to what Paul says. In Romans 7 from verse 5, he says, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou should not covet. But sin, taking occasion of the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. But sin, that it may appear sin, work at death in me but that which is good. He says, the very thing that was supposed to save me destroys me. And the moment the law comes, what happens? Sin is revived. 
It's almost like it activates rebellion against God. And that is why God continued to ask, what else must I do with these people? That is why even in here you go, Celestius, less than after 70 years, it's the same fight. It's the same reconciliation that we kept doing. It's the same complaint. And we keep saying these people will not change. But how can they change? And listen to what 2 Corinthians says. Listen to what the Lord Paul calls the law. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in fleshy tablets of the heart. And such trust that we through Christ to God work. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, or we think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also had made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For what? The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life this is Christ so when he says that we are cursed yes all of us we're cursed until Jesus came and became the curse for us because it is written cursed is anybody who dies on the tree he has taken the curse he has taken the problem he has taken everywhere it is consolidated entirely in him but what are we given then and I read about a man who left the church in Nigeria and told his driver to pull over on the highway. And he came out of the car and jumped to his death. What was not given such a soul to have delivered him? How can you leave church even twofold the son of the devil if the truth is being given to you? Man's charge against us is that we simply remain recalcitrant. Man's charge against God is that it is easy for you to call me a sinner when you sit up there wrapped in your glory, wrapped in your holiness, wrapped in your righteousness, and say no sin can ever come near me, no uncleanliness can even touch me. When you say even the heavens are not clean before you, it is easy for you to speak of righteousness. Are you made of clay? Do you live in a body where even in the very same body that I live in, sin thrives and prospers therein? Do you know the contradictions, the temptations I have to deal with? It is easy for you to sit up there and to say that. Job said it in Job 9. From verse 32, he says, For he's not a man as I am that I should answer him, that we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any day man betwixt us, that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away and let him not terrify me. Then when I speak and not fear him, but he's not so with me. Now listen to what Job says in Job 10. Listen to this. It says uh, in verse 2, I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Is it good unto thee that thou should oppress, that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Hast thou eyes of the flesh? Or seest thou as the man seeth? Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as the man's days? Why then do you inquire after my iniquity? You know nothing of our struggle here. And that the Lord may be what? That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. The Lord said, I will go in flesh, in blood. I will feel their temptations. I will feel their pain. I will feel their trials. I will feel their sorrows. And then I will be their just priest and the mediator between man and God. This is why we preach Christ. There is no other place where salvation can be found. And the Gentiles that are coming, they're not interested in the stories of Papa Shofar. God bless his soul. We know him. That doesn't mean anything to the Gentiles that are coming. A man said to me just last week, Dami, I need to speak to the shepherd and I don't know how to raise it up. I go, what? He goes, we're losing our children. My children don't want to come to church anymore. They don't want to connect anymore. And if I ask them to, they ask me one question. Who is preaching today? And if I say this person, they go, no, never mind. Do you know how many times people have come to me and said, oh, I want to invite my friend, but can you please tell me who's preaching on this date? This is in this church. If it has happened here, and we're losing our children, at what point do we realize something is missing? And what are they going out there for? For the works, for the miracles, they're not interested in that. There is only one thing they care about. The flesh and the blood of Christ. But this is the thing we treat as secondary and tertiary. 
Beloved, we play a great role in what is about to happen. What the Lord was showing in that stadium is what he purposes. And this church is playing a great part in that, but we need to come to the servant. We need to come out from being uncomfortable. Every ministry has to stand up and be up and doing. The prophetic ministry has to be up and doing. The evangelical ministry, you know, we can sit there. Let me tell you one secret. I don't care how much you pray, how many candles you use, how much perfume you drink. You cannot ever make the Lord give you a spirit of prophecy. You can never make the Lord increase your spirit of prophecy. It is entirely his mandate and his will according to his grace. Go to the book of Deuteronomy and you see how many times, you're not Deuteronomy, First Samuel. Every time Saul sent people to Ramah to go find David and kill him, he sent like 30 messengers. You know what happened to them? They all started prophesying. Then Saul heard, where are the messengers? They all prophesied in Ramah. He sent another set. The spirit fell upon them. They all started prophesying. Then he sent the third set. They all started prophesying. Then Saul himself now went. And the spirit came upon Saul. And he started prophesying. He took off his clothes. And that is where the saying came from. Is Saul now amongst the prophets? If someone who was going to commit murder. The Lord gave the spirit of prophecy to. Do you think this is by anyone's power? But the Lord says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. What does he mean? The spirit of prophecy is the Holy Ghost. Because he says it will take what it is mine and make known unto you. The only way to continue to increase is to increase your knowledge of Christ and to increase your knowledge of God. That's the way you determine to grow. Not by anything else. The same what he has given the evangelist is the same word given to prophets. The difference between an evangelist and a prophet is he is doing it to the mass. The prophet does it on a personal level. Let us grow. Bible class, we come and what happened? Everybody sits back. Talk. Did you read? We didn't read. I remember once we were doing the book of Genesis and after three weeks, somebody came to me and said, it's getting boring. Can we do something else? This is who we are. If everybody studies the word and you take notes, even if it's questions, there is no reason why the Bible class should be silent and we should be begging and looking for people to speak. We can get better. I can get better. Marriage ministry is great. I can give you word of the week, but let me tell you something. The word of the week is not affecting what is going on in people's homes. We've got to get better. As a church, we have to get better. When people come to us and say they have a migraine, let's stop giving them Pepto-Bismol. Because we send them away and they go back with more or what? A spiritual diarrhea. Finally, this Christ that I've been speaking about, I love what he says here in Isaiah 42. He says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect to whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He's not going to call you by your sin. He's not going to call you out in public. He's not here to humiliate you. You're going to hear his voice inside your heart. That's where he speaks. Then he goes further. He says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. Such a bruised reed was the woman in John 8. A reed has no strength, and to bruise it is to kill it. She was already condemned. She was already weak. Her tormentors were already taking her and bringing her to Christ for him to break her completely. Or did he break her? No. Instead, he mended that reed. He saved her. He took her guilt, he took her shame, and he vanquished it. And he did in her what no word can do, what no man can do. And said, go now and sin no more. And from that moment, she was devoted and dedicated to this Christ. Can any man do that? A smoldering flax was such was Didymus, the penitent thief on the right hand of the cross, who was already dead and extinguished. It was a smoking flax. He was done. The world had condemned him. He was crucified. But yet he turned to Christ and said one thing. Remember me in your kingdom. Did Christ crucify him or kill him? No. Instead he took that smoldering flax and he fanned it into a flame. And said today 
you will be with me in paradise. This is what happens when men turn to Christ. When Zacchaeus was in the sycamore tree and he looked and he saw Jesus, his life was changed. When men come into contact with Christ, that's what happened. He goes into your soul. He pierces into it. He finds the darkness. He reaches down and he brings it out. There is no pain he cannot touch. There is no illness he cannot cure. There is no trouble he cannot attend. There is no loneliness. His presence does not completely dissipate. And there is no sin. However odious to the sight of man, that the fragrance of his love cannot overcome and overpower. Men, will you come to this Christ? Will you lead men to Christ? The Gentiles are coming. The OG, when are we going to build ourselves into the temple of Christ? But remember, the grace is for a while. Because this same Christ who preaches love and mercy and says there is no sin I can't forgive can also shut the door. And when he does, what a ruthless and unmerciful king you will find him. And I will end with this. Matthew 7 from 21 it reads, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works. And will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I said to my father, I said, I'm not worried about hell. He said, my son, you worried. I said, I'm not worried about hell. And the reason I said that is, if I'm in hell, and I know my Savior is coming, I'm not afraid. He said, concerning himself in the book of David and the psalm, he says, I know you will not abandon your Holy One into hell. But when Christ says, depart from me, it means he's not coming. It means there is no Savior. It means there is no salvation. It means the door of his mercy and his love has been shut. It means the blackest darkness you cannot even imagine. It means being reminded of your iniquities and your foolishness day and night. It means being with the devils day and night. But much more importantly, it means permanent separation from God in Christ. There is nothing worse than that. Nothing worse than being separated from the love of God in Christ. Today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Voice of grace, it might be good, but the good is the enemy of the best. How are you going to discharge your part in the ministry the Lord has given to you? Michael has been struggling there. Go ahead, read it. Read it. Revelation 4 from verse 13. Yes. Yes. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? Yes. These things says Amen, the faithful and true. Yes, Christ, Jesus Christ. God. Yes. I know thy works. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. I wish you were one or the other. So then because thou art lukewarm. So because you are lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot. Neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. May we not be spewed out of the mouth of Christ. But whether we like it or not, the Gentiles are coming. You may not be here. You may think I'm important and I can never be lost. As a kid I was working with, and one day our CEO was there, and he was very important, and he was very loved by everyone. And he said to the CEO as the CEO was walking out, he says, I can never be fired. And the CEO, I will never forget, stopped. He was already gone. And he came back. He said, let me say something to you. Never say you can ever be fired. Anyone is expendable. Six months later, the kid was terminated. One year later, the COO was terminated. You are not indispensable. I am not indispensable. Build yourself in Christ. And let us fulfill the purpose of the Lord for Celestia. May the Lord bless us all the world. Amen.